Yeah, so hi everyone, thank you for coming to the talk. I'm happy to be here for the second time. I was here last year for a workshop about fuzzing. So my name is Roland Sacco. I'm a security researcher at Kaspersky ICS CERT. Unfortunately, uh, my colleague Nikolai Frolov couldn't come to the talk because he got a visa issue in last minute, so I'm going to give the talk by myself. So we are, as I said, we are security researchers. Uh, we mainly focus on automotive research, so uh, searching for vulnerabilities in cars and stuff related to automotive. Also ICS devices, so uh, industrial control system, IoT, uh, consumer IoT or industrial IoT. And then we do a bunch of uh, vulnerability research through fuzzing and reverse engineering. We also give some training sometimes. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out also to all of my colleagues from the team because uh, since we did the research ourselves, there are also some huge support from our team members and managers. So uh, just a shout out to my colleagues there. So what I'm going to talk about today is two small little devices that are interesting, uh, fun, and uh, so that's going to be a smart pet feeder and a smart educational robot that is using AI. And you probably think, why does it matter? It's just a small little device, it's a smart pet feeder, nothing critical. And as you can see, as we will be seeing during the presentation, uh, it doesn't matter if it's critical or not, it still has an impact. Let's get started with, with the smart pet feeder. So uh, I do have a cat. I don't know if uh, any of you guys have pet at home, a cat or a dog. I do have a cat. Um, it's very useful to have such devices because, um, first of all, you don't have to manage the schedule for feeding the cat or the dog or whatever or the pet you have. Uh, you can do it in advance and say, that, for example, every day at 8 in the morning, there's going to be that amount of food on the table. Uh, you can also remotely access it. Uh, there's a camera, there's a microphone, you can talk to the pet. Interesting device. And one thing I, most of the time I do before I get started with the research, in that case, we ordered the device, it took a few uh, days to come. I had a look at the FCC database. So, FCC is uh, the organism that regulates the um, telecommunication in the US, so every single device that you have uh, that communicate on the, any frequency has to comply with the FCC. So basically they have to, yeah, yeah, okay. They have to fill documentation with the details, with test setup, internal pictures, etc., and they have to comply. And the good thing is everything is then is public. I think you probably, if you look at your phone or something that you have at home, you will see this FCC logo. And there's an ID. So with, with this FCC ID, you can access to the information that is public. In that case, what was interesting to me was the internal pictures. So I look at the internal pictures and I see this. So basically, it seems like it's just a smart camera in a big box with some mechanisms to dispense the food. So pretty interesting. Sometimes it's also good for me to have this kind of picture because I can see what is on the PCB and I can get my tool ready in order to get the correct adapters and stuff in advance. In that case, the, uh, the, the picture of quality is not very good, so I couldn't see nothing. Okay, so now that I get the device, first step is to get it connected. You have to install the app, create your account, and put your Wi-Fi name and password, and it will generate the QR code. You show the QR code to the pet feeder camera, and you just get connected to the network. Nothing special. First thing first, I set up a proxy. And uh, you see there is a bunch of uh, HTTPS requests and one HTTP request in clear text. Uh, funny enough, not really funny, but um, most of the requests are using HTTPS with certificate pinning. I was able to see that because I instrumented the app so I could see the traffic. The last request is using HTTP and it has a bunch of parameters, including my phone number, which is used as a user ID. And then there's also 
the command name, which uh, it says um, uh, sync feed list. For now, we don't really know what it is, but it doesn't really matter. Now, I'm looking for the low hanging fruit, so the very easy stuff. So it's connected to my network. I'll do a quick nmap scan. And what I see is uh, there's a telnet port open. Good news for me, at least. So now, that's a very good start for me because it's like very easy to exploit in principle. I mean, just connect to it. Only thing is they set up a password and the username, so I needed a way to extract the username and password. First thing I do is just crack open the device. Thanks to the FCC ID pictures, I could see where the PCB is located without destroying the device completely. And as you can see, it's just a simple little chip uh, uh, that talks SPI. So usually the firmware is stored there. So uh, I just need to extract the information and then I get access to the firmware. There are different ways to do that. I had a tool that is called Bus Pirate. So Bus Pirate is the tool that is able to talk different protocols. Uh, it can talk SPI. So I use that connected to the pins correctly and use Flashworm, which is an open source software to extract, um, to, to program such chip. For some reasons, I had some issues. So I had to move to another solution. And other solution is a bit more destructive. So I use the hot hair gun and I unsolder the chip, put it on the chip programmer and read it out. Like very straightforward. I had the old content. Good. Now, in order to continue the research, I had to, uh, to solder it back. Uh, that's not for me. I, I didn't want to do it because of laziness, but also I thought if I need to change something inside the device and then just keep going for testing, I didn't want to unsolder, resolder, etc. So I just kept it like this, and I just kept it on the adapter, on the breadboard, put the connection point to the PCB, and then just continue working with that. So once you, once you read everything from the chip, uh, I use Beanwalk to see what is inside to extract the information. Nothing special, just a embedded Linux file system with everything that we know. This, now we moved from, uh, like little hardware stuff to software problems. Let's say uh, software research. Um, I told you there was, um, uh, telnet network uh, server running. I didn't have the credentials. So automatically I go to the shadow file. I see the hash of the password. Next step, I try to crack it. So I set up my basement with, uh, no, just kidding. I just Googled the, the hash and I found it first results. Funny thing is uh, many of the cameras uh, from High Silicon and some other brands are using the same credential for some reason. I don't know if it's probably part of a SDK and then you use the default credentials, but it doesn't really matter. I got the password connected to the device and I'm root. Um, I get root access, so I get full power to the device. Only thing you need to uh, keep in mind is that you need to be on a local network, the same local network. This attack doesn't work from outside of the network. But it's still interesting. Then, um, looking to the file system, I saw something interesting in the start of script. So at the beginning of the device, there is a, a script called run Alex that is run that is responsible for launching a binary that is called MQTT Alex with an IP address. And this is basically connecting to an MQTT server in order to receive the, um, voice command. So basically that device can be controlled with the mobile application, but also with the voice command through uh, Alexa. So started reversing the binary in the main, not very visible there, but yeah, in the main function, you see there is a MQTT init authentication. So what the first thing it does is connect to the MQTT broker with the credentials and the credentials are all coded into the binary. So. Basically, if I install any MQTT client, I could connect remotely to the broker and then access to all of the information. 
And once the device connects, it does a bunch of uh, subscribe. So MQTT works on a pop-sub uh, principle, so it means that you subscribe to a topic, and then whenever someone publishes on that topic, you receive the information. In that case, there was uh, the main topic was voice, and then you have the command, and after that you have a secret ID. And the secret ID is the secret ID for each device. This is how it works. So whenever you launch a uh, voice command, it will send uh, a message in JSON format with voice. Shoot rack is the command, and then the secret ID. So basically, if I know the secret ID of a user, I could send any command that I want. So how this secret ID is generated? Uh, not so complicated. Uh, it's basically using a bunch of information that are static and one information dynamically, which is the MAC address of the device. Doesn't really matter because since we are in MQTT and the secret ID is part of the topic, what I could just do is create, uh, take, um, MQTT client, connect to the broker, and then with that connection, subscribe to all the subtopics. So basically you connect, you uh, subscribe to voice and then use the wildcard, which means that every subtopic will be uh, the topics that you're interested in. Once you do that, you get all of the information that is going on the MQTT server. And then further, uh, this is a test MQTT broker. So of course, we're not going to test it on production from the vendor. I just set up my own MQTT server with the same credential. I had my device connect to it to see what is going on. What you can do is not very critical at that point. I can just extra feed the, the pets uh, indefinitely, have it like going that way. Another interesting fact is if you look further on the parsing code, that is uh, basically most of the time where the critical issues are, the memory issues are, you can see that um, the code assume that the values are not null. There's no integrity check. There's nothing checking the size of uh, the received packet, etc. And uh, doing some very little uh, dumb fuzzing I could make the binary crash. So basically, if you send a message to any device uh, and you miss one of the field, you will just crash the binary. So you have a DDoS attack very uh, easily. And then I was interested in how the backend communication was done from the device to the backend. I found the function that are responsible for communicating. And interesting, interestingly enough, I saw that it was only using curl and doing a bunch of HTTP requests, not even encrypted. And there we go. We have our CMD, which is the topic. And then we have the upload key, which is the same for every device. So basically, everything is done through HTTP. And um, if you're in a position where you can be a man in the middle, you can just tinker with everything that you want. And finally, the update process, uh, very interesting. Um, I rarely saw this kind of, uh, kind of things. They simply have their update, um, file on a, on a server. It's a zip file that is encrypted with a password and the password is hard coded into a script that is in the device. So basically, um, if you manage to get access to the backend, you create your malicious update file, you encrypt it with the same password, and then you can potentially have their other device infected. So yeah, somehow someone had to uh, put all of these little issues into this device and make it not very, uh, very secure. Uh, vendor communication, uh, unfortunately, wasn't that good. So I started, we started uh, communicating with the vendor October 2022, and until February 2023, we didn't have any answer. And then in March, we had some uh, contact with the vendor, 
and uh, we asked them to establish some encrypted communication. So uh, give uh, give um, give us uh, their uh, GPG key so we can uh, send everything encrypted. No answers, so we just published. So let's say that the vendor communication was not very successful. Okay, so next one uh, is a small little robot that is also a fun device for kids. So basically it allows you to uh, give it to your kid so they can help um, the kid do the homework, uh, learn a new language, do some mathematics, physics, and stuff like this. Uh, the vendor claimed that every single bit of information is encrypted, protected, and uh, that's for your privacy and the privacy of your child, so nothing to worry about. First thing we do is to connect the device to our network and uh, start monitoring the traffic. The first thing we see is HTTP requests everywhere. So there we go again. There we go again. Next thing, again, uh, we take the device, tear it apart, apart, look at the PCB, bunch of uh, components. In our case, we're not really interested into all of these uh, components. We go straight to the memory. And uh, so this is the picture where I got started to uh, put the pin by pin because I didn't have the correct reader. At the end, it's the huge mess because there's wire everywhere. Uh, but at the end, we managed to extract data for the EMC. And then we started analyzing the firmware. Interesting things is uh, we look at the USB configuration. We saw that there is ADB enabled. And whenever we connect it to the computer, uh, we start uh, connecting after the third line there. And we see ADB for five seconds and then disappear. Why that? Uh, so basically when the device gets started, there is then um, um, main, uh, main application, that is the launcher, who is responsible to uh, interact with the uh, configuration and check whether the ADB is activated or not. And basically it does it by checking a file. And that file will manage to just change from enable no to en enable yes, and then connecting to the device through USB, we had root access through ADB. So now let's go back to the back end. So the back end is also very interesting. Um, interesting in a, in the sense that it's not really good. But the, <laughs> the password is uh, a six uh, digit and character, a mix of uh, digit and character, only six in uh, size, which is pretty weak. And then they're using the serial number as a login. And still regarding the passwords, this is the function that is um, responsible for generating a password. So that's pretty weak. So basically it's just taking a bunch of like small, small little data and converting to hexadecimal and that's pretty much it. Even better, so, you connect to the, you can make it with the backend using the login uh, API. You put a random password and you still get a token. So basically, there is a function that check for the authentication that does nothing. They just return you a token. So it doesn't really matter if you have the correct password or not. You just get the token and you just get access. And we keep going, so we have another endpoint, get app configuration. Here, uh, also a little bit weird, so basically if you connect to that endpoint and you provide the robot ID, then you get a bunch of information. So you get the child name, the age, which is not very critical that much, if you choose the first name and the age, but then you have the exact location of that robot. And then the check authentication, same thing. You provide the robot ID, and you get the username, password, uh, the parent email, phone number, and some useless information. But still, uh, basically, you get all the credential for every. You can enumerate all the credential for all the user for that robot. And um, 
Also something that I didn't know about before uh, we get started with this research, but uh, they are using Django REST framework, which is a framework that I'm not really aware about, but that what we detected is they had the um, debug enabled to true, which means that we could enumerate a bunch of information. So for example, we can see all of the endpoints. We could see error messages in details. And uh, we managed to figure out that they are using Agora in order to handle the video stream. So the video stream allows the parents to call the kids through the robot and then have some visual conf uh, conversation. And um, whenever you send that request without providing, providing nothing, you get a token for free. So you can communicate uh, using Agora for just uh, without providing any proof of uh, being the owner of the robot. And in order to use the Agora API, you need the token, so the token that you got for free last slide. Then you need the Agora app ID, which is the same for every owner of the robot. And then you need the serial number. So the serial number, as we saw previously, is very easy to guess or to enumerate. And then uh, what we did is just like trying to make a call to a robot, a second robot that we bought. And it worked out straightforward, very easy to uh, export. So basically, anyone who get access to uh, a robot ID or simply enumerated uh, all the robot ID that are existing can make a call to any children that are owner of this robot. And then the mobile application. Also an interesting uh, thing, so whenever we need to pair uh, mobile application with the device, or you need to change the, the owner of the, the robot, you have to provide either the email address or the phone number, and after that you will receive an OTP code, which is a six digit or, or letter, and then you have five minutes to put it. And during our testing, we noticed that there is no um, uh, protection for brute force. So basically you can try as much as you can, as you want, within these five minutes, and there is no limit. So, oops. so yeah, at some point you'll, you'll manage to just crack and uh, just get in. So once you get in the application from another person, you can uh, detach the robot from that uh, the actual parents. And usually, uh, when you get the first pairing, this is a code that is shown on the robot screen that you have to put on the mobile application. And um, as we saw previously, this uh, password is the one that is uh, detect, uh, generated in the password field there. So you can easily get it, even without having any credential from the users. And then finally, the updating process is also uh, pretty weird because uh, it's simply a script that is downloaded from a server and there is no signature, uh, there is no uh, integrity check. So basically, if someone managed to get into the server and then change it and put some commands over there, uh, you can uh, get remote code execution very easily. Uh, vendor communication. Uh, that case was pretty successful, so March uh, 2023, uh, we communicated with the vendor for the first time, and after a couple of weeks, they got back to us, and they acknowledged, um, they, so they confirmed that they received the report, and then they were going to verify it. And then after a few months, they acknowledged the security issues, and they actually fixed them a couple of weeks after that also. And then we decided to publish the results. Uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, just let me know. Otherwise, there is all the detail of the research for the robot, for the pet feeder. We already have a like, small paper with some more details. Doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Do you have any questions? Ronald, that was pretty interesting, especially because we live in that age and time where we are using smart devices. We are there to make our life easier, but apparently at the cost, as you explained. 
What do you think uh, vendors should have in mind when they uh, design these things? Obviously, we have seen some issues, but they are not responding. Uh, and then you just go ahead and you publish your uh, research. But what they should do in order, what's that fine line maybe where it is secure, but then it's still like friendly, like an easy to set up to have that user experience? I mean, first thing in general is to, first of all, answer the, <laughs> whenever we try to communicate with the vendor, just answer. Um, another thing is, um, I thought it was already clear that you should not assume as a, uh, IoT device maker that people would not access to the device itself. So for example, with the pet feeder, uh, having all these art coded password credentials, um, Typically, if you're doing software of research, you're not going to probably get into the credential. Uh, as you can see, with like very little basic, uh, let's say hardware, what I just did is extract the firmware from the chip, which doesn't imply any uh, sort of advanced knowledge in hardware, uh, and not even uh, pricey equipment I could access to the internals. And... Again, this is really some secondary research that we do uh, outside of our normal duty. So it's just a proof that after spending a few hours on some kind of devices like this, you can already find some like uh, very critical um, critical issues. Sometimes it's also because people take a uh, device from a Chinese brand unnamed and they put their name on it and then they just don't check nothing. And the most important thing for them is to have everything working in terms of functionality, but then security comes really after. But um, I don't think there's more recommendation for these IoT makers more than traditional uh, software manufacturer. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, be aware of the attack vectors. And also for the users, especially whenever you choose some kind of devices like this and thinking they are not critical because they are fundamentally, they are not very critical devices, but it gives an attacker access to confidential data. And it can also be some kind of bridge to uh, conduct attack to other devices at home. So, yeah. That's great. Thank you. Any other question? Yeah. First of all, thank you. It was really cool talk also to like show your your inner working so thanks for that um do you in your role right do you think over the years is it getting better or worse because you, you mentioned a few things right that they seemingly doing right but then obviously lots of other flaws so you mentioned certificate pinning but then also i don't know you were still able to bypass it and get to the commands and stuff right do you think on the whole yeah so is, is it getting better or worse basically uh, it is getting better because, uh, so for example, the first device is using Tuya Smart, which is a framework to develop IoT devices. It's, I think it's Chinese. It's pretty good. Uh, if you order devices from AliExpress or some other places, sometimes they're using this framework. So basically, it's well tested, pretty much. Uh, the problem comes from, so if you uh, focus on the first, um, exchange one I, that you mentioned. So there is some bunch of HTTPS requests and then one single HTTP one. Um, my assumption is they took the, uh, Tuya smart framework to do the basic stuff and then they added stuff afterwards. And the stuff that they added, they didn't pay attention to any sort of security. And there are more and more framework to work with that are secure that allows them to get started at least with something that uh, is not too bad, let's say. Um, so, yeah, if they start using existing stuff that are proved to be pretty much secure and then the do correct implementation, it's already a good stuff. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was very great. Thanks again for uh, coming back to Christina. Thank you.